Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Our Father, our King, we thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, the joy in the day of it being Shabbat, where we can uh, say everything is good that you created, and we are, and you created all things, and we thank you for that. Uh, may your blessing be upon uh, our time uh, here today. May you be glorified in it, and uh, that the Holy Spirit would do a work among us. And we pray it in Yeshua's name. Amen. Buried within this week's Parsha. Now it's, it's not a long section of, of Scripture. It's like three chapters of numbers. But buried within it are two verses that are really, really important. In the Hebrew, on the scrolls, there's something that we miss in the English translation, in our English Bibles. Uh, the Hebrew, in the scrolls, puts brackets around these two verses in the form of a nun. And just these two verses are bracketed. We say them every Shabbat before we read the scriptures and when we're finished reading the scriptures. And they're uh, two verses that we rejoice in because of their truth. They're two verses that require reverence. And they're two verses that require some introspection because of their deep, deep truth. And it's Numbers chapter 10, verses 35 in 36. And here's what it says. And this is bracketed in the Torah scrolls. Probably not in your version of the Bible. Whenever the ark would set out, Moses would say, Arise, Adonai, may your enemies be scattered. May those who hate you flee from before you. And whenever it came to rest, he would say, Return, Adonai, to the myriad thousands of Israel. Myriad there is the uh, Hebrew algebraic term of like, uncountable. You can't count how many thousands of Israel. Many have speculated why these verses are enclosed in brackets and some say that they're a book within a book because they contain so much meaning. And when you think about it, they, they do say so much about the power of God's word and the power of God himself in just two verses. And so it's as if it's a book within the book. So far, the annual reading cycle has seen us see the power of God's word in creation. We've watched as he called out Abram and promised so many offspring that he would never be able to count them. And then through Isaac and Jacob, the family grew. Uh, we watched as the family and, and some people not part of the family came out of Egypt, particularly how the children of Israel were freed from bondage. And all of this happened not in the power of men, but in the power of God. Abraham and Sarah were uh, the people that God chose. They they didn't choose themselves. Sarah couldn't have any children prior to God's intervention. And God was the one who heard the cries of the children of Israel and brought them out of Egypt. The children of Israel did not escape Egypt by themselves. It was by the power of God. God was the one who chose Moses, and Moses declined that opportunity at first. But then he kind of wound up knowing that he didn't have a choice. Uh, we read how Israel received instruction, the Torah, from God through Moses, how God provided food in the form of manna, and they didn't have to work for that. God provided it, and all they had to do was gather that up in the morning. Even though God did all of this, some of the camp of Israel still wanted to go back to Egypt. They still wanted to have what they had in Egypt. I think what they 
wanted really was to go back to their old life where they were comfortable. Perhaps it was out of rebellion. Some think that it was out of rebellion. I think it was because they wanted to be comfortable. It was what they were used to. Because the future is full of unknowns. For those who don't fully trust God, th those unknowns can be scary. They could be uncomfortable. And so the, the people who didn't fully trust God amongst the children of Israel wanted to go back because the future had too many of those unknowns. And certainly when we see the spies go out, they see giants in Canaan. That's the next part of the, this coming week. And I, I get it. They see these giants in the land. They think that they're more powerful than God is. And I get that. The, the future is filled with unknowns. Most of us could not have predicted the path or the journey that we were on to get here today. And, and I mean in the sense of where you are in your life today. Five years ago, ten years ago, you, you probably had no clue that you'd be at this point. All things that happened to us between now and then, we wouldn't have known. We wouldn't have predicted. But they happen because God is in control. We look back and we say, how did that happen? We look forward and maybe think, do I really have to stomach for what God has planned for the future. What does he want me to do? What does God want me to go through tomorrow, next month, next year, or in the next 10 years? I don't know what that plan is for me. And I'm sure you feel that some, the same way. And you go, you know, I look back, then I look forward. Do I have the stomach for this? I can put myself in the sandals of the children of Israel. And we have so much more information about God in the future than they had. We have the book of Revelation. We, we know about Yeshua. We, we know about our Messiah. They didn't have that. The one thing that we know for certain is that if we allow God to lead will be on the path that he wants us to take if we allow him to lead. Today, believers are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. We have the power of prayer. We can call upon God for wisdom. They, they were much more limited in the time that we're reading about, just over a year after the Exodus, the crossing of the Sea of Reeds. They saw some miraculous things happen. But we have more than they have. So it's useful to see where their strength came from, to see what's available for us today. So let's go to chapter 10, verse 33. When they set out on a three days journey, it says that the ark went out and the cloud of Adonai was over them by day. And Moses shouted, Arise, O Lord, may your enemies be scattered and may your foes flee from before you. We need to recognize the power of God's word. I know that most of us understand the power of God's word at some intellectual level. We've got it in our head, and we know that God's word is powerful. But we have to take it from an intellectual level and allow it to penetrate our heart, our soul, and our mind. And when you get uh, to the level, to that level of understanding God's word, that it's absolutely powerful, when you get to that level, it's going to make a tremendous difference, not only in your life, but in the world as well. Our individual lives will change. We will truly realize that the choices that we are making need to be proceeded or preceded by being in God's word and by being in prayer praying for God's guidance. The visible cloud of Adonai is not moving ahead of us anymore. Don't you wish we had the cloud that we could look out the window 
look at the tabernacle and say, oh, we are to go and move forward. But we don't have that anymore. The visible cloud isn't there, but we do have the Holy Spirit inside of us, which is much, much closer than looking for the cloud of God over the tabernacle. And we can ask God ahead of time to guide us all through the day. Here in Numbers, what we know is that the cloud was searching for the next place to rest and the community would rest there. But I think that's it's safe to extrapolate that to today as we look for the place where God wants us to be as individuals to settle down or camp, if you will, and do what he wants to have get done. We learned from this passage that the cloud of Adonai would settle in one spot for how long? A day, a week, a month, or longer? They didn't know how long it would stay there. There's no indication that it, there would be any advance notice that the cloud would move. So Israel would have to be ready to pick up all that stuff and move all those people in a moment's notice. Moses would direct them. But you had to pick up the tabernacle. You had to pick up your tent, get the luggage, start the car. Oh, they didn't have car. Um, and, and get out there. There are many times when God will lead us to do things and to do an activity at a moment's notice. And are we ready to do that? So we have to be ready for those times where for example, you're running an errand and the Holy Spirit tells you you need to go and visit so-and-so or you need to call somebody or, or pray with somebody and you're going, no, I need to get this errand done. I need to get this chore done. I've got to do this activity that I'm on. I can't derail myself and do what the Holy Spirit is saying that I should do because I'm too busy. But we can't operate that way. We need to be ready in a moment's notice that if you're walking down the aisle of the store and, and there's somebody and the Holy Spirit is saying, speak to that person, you're going, no, I need to go and check out and get out of here. You need to stop and speak to that person. If you ignore the prodding of the Holy Spirit, you'll miss out on something that God had planned for you. And here are some of the ways that God will move us when we might not expect it. He'll guide us to those divine appointments. He'll tug at us when we say that we're too busy or too shy for one of those divine appointments. We should be praying for those divine appointments. But sometimes those divine appointments come at really inconvenient times. He will help us to learn to pray first thing in the morning. He'll help us to say, that uh, we're not too busy to pray. He'll help us to meet the needs of people around us and a whole lot more if we just open ourselves to him. But we have to be very, very careful that we are listening to God and not to something else. That's why you need to know and understand and apply the scripture. And that's why you need to have an active prayer life so that you know that what you're hearing is the Holy Spirit and not some other spirit. I've seen people make massively huge mistakes because they thought God was steering them in one direction and it turned out that they were listening to a spirit that was not God. That's why we have to be in the word. That's why we need to be praying. I'd highly question if the Holy Spirit told me at one o'clock in the morning to get out of, drive down to downtown and walk through Art Alley because there's somebody that wants to meet me there. I might do it, I might bring my gun. <laughs> you gotta watch out what spirit you're listening to. Maybe that is the Holy Spirit saying you need to do that and, and be there, but you gotta be very, very cautious. But you have to use judgment. You have to know the scriptures. 
and of the, the Holy Spirit is never going to lead you in a direction that's not compatible with the scriptures. Here in Numbers 10, it was obvious when God was leading Israel. Today we have the Holy Spirit, but you have to be in tune with God to know when he is speaking or you're going to be deceived, and I can't stress that enough. We see it every day. When somebody thinks that they're listening to the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of God, and they're walking into a trap of the devil. The other thing in Numbers 10, verses 33 to 35, is that we know God is powerful and his enemies know it as well. For those of us who sometimes struggle with facing the day, we can take comfort in the fact that we rely on him, and when we do so, his enemies will flee from before us. Chances are that his enemies are your enemies too. Because you have the Holy Spirit, if you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. And so you're going to become an enemy of God's enemy. These two verses within these parentheses, within the chapter uh, chapter 10 of Numbers, we, we see that we can trust that where God is and in what he is doing, his enemies are going to flee from him and flee from the ark, from the scriptures. The application that I would have for us today, first of all, would be that some of the worst enemies for us, you and I, are the ones that we create in our own mind. And that's what happened to the spies. In a couple of chapters, we're going to see that most of the spies went out and came back with a terrible report, giants in the land. That was true. But as it turns out, they were giants who were terrified of the God of Israel because they had heard what had happened to Egypt at the Exodus. There's a French philosopher by the name of Michel de Mano I butchered the name. He wrote, and it's, it's a long time ago, long, long, a couple hundred years ago. He wrote this, my life has been filled with terrible misfortune, most of which never happened. Sometimes that's the way we are. We, we, we think of terrible things, but they never happen. Knowing the power and the might of God and that the Holy Spirit indwells you ought to rid you of negative hype that we tend to become paralyzed with. And that's what happened to the spies and then that happened to the children of Israel. They became paralyzed because they didn't put their trust in God. They had their own negative hype. So, anyway. If you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit, God's enemies are going to flee the Holy Spirit. If you're suppressing the Holy Spirit, quenching the Spirit, the enemies of God may not flee, and you could have problems. So the takeaway is don't quench the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit work through you. Always strive to walk in the Spirit, to allow the Spirit to be in full control. That's part of the Apostle Paul's die daily to yourself. Number two, if you fill your heart and mind with God's word, God's enemies will flee the holy scriptures that you're carrying around inside of you, in your heart and in your mind. There are two ways to handle scriptures. You can know them at an intellectual level. You can recite them chapter and verse or the better way is to know and understand and apply those scriptures to both your mind and your heart. And that's the, where you need to be, where we need to be. Number three, know where God is going. It is better to be in prayer ahead of time and seek God's guidance and wisdom ahead of time instead of going back. There's no massive cloud of God to follow uh, you can learn to know when the Holy Spirit is leading you, especially when you know and apply the scriptures to your heart. Pray ahead of time. 
sometimes you'll do unintentional sin because you didn't pray ahead of time and you walked into a situation where you shouldn't have been. The word of God and the power of God are inseparable. They are powerful and we need to look at them as God's strength and shield for us. The enemies of God will flee if we do that. We also need to see the small section um, in this small section, the, the need to be united and unified. The children of Israel needed to move in a moment's notice. Besides living and working together, they needed to be in unity for that time when they had to move. You were moving a couple of million people. The Levites were in charge of moving the tabernacle, right? <clears throat> but then all these other people had to move too, and it had to be organized. And it couldn't be this pushing and shoving ahead like it's Black Friday at Walmart and you're going to crush the, 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 you know, the sons of Reuben that are, in, that are ahead of you. Hey, get out of my way. There had to be unity. So as the time comes to enter the promised land, this moving at a moment's notice in unity and uniformly, uh, comes into play when moving into the promised land. The people needed to get along. And they needed to move. And as we move through the rest of Numbers and uh, uh, Deuteronomy, God is bringing the body of Israel into unity. And we'll talk about that more next week, just so you know. The enemy of God is cursed by the word of God. God's grace and mercy is available to all of those who repent, who do uh, teshuva. Turn towards the scripture and turn towards him. And for the unrepentant, their lives will eventually come to destruction. It really boils down to making decisions. Given all of the information that we have about God and how easy it is to repent um, and to accept Yeshua as Messiah, I, I don't think the choice can be more clear. You, you, you choose, you know what the alternatives are. In the Haftar portion, it takes us to Zechariah chapters 2 and 3 and part of 4. But I'm not going there. I'm going to chapter 5. Because I can. <laughs> chapter 5, starting at verse 2 says, then the angel asked me, what do you see? And I replied, I see a flying scroll 30 feet long and 15 feet wide. He said to me, this is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole land. Everyone who steals will be swept away from here according to it. And everyone who swears will be swept away from here according to it. I will send it out. It is a declaration of Adonai Savot and it will enter into the house of the thief and into the house of the one who swears falsely by my name and will reside inside his house, destroying it, both its wood and its stones. The scroll is the Torah. While the enemy flees from the word of the Lord, the enemy can't flee forever and will be eventually destroyed. In this case, the enemy of God's house will be utterly and completely destroyed as the words of the Lord enter the enemy's house. The connection that I see is that of Egypt in the night when the judgment fell on the firstborn of that night is just a picture of what is to come. The day is coming when all of God's enemies who do not hold firm to God's teachings are destroyed. Not only will they flee, but they're going to be destroyed as well. And all of this is not necessarily to hit you at some emotional level. So you go, I don't want that to happen to me. Yes, that's true. I, I don't want that to happen to you. I don't want that to happen to me. But we have to realize the power of God and his word. He is the creator and the king of the universe. We might think that on some level, he is our equal, but he's not. 
Some people take Jesus, Yeshua, as being their equal. Oh, what a friend we have in Yeshua, which is true. But he's not our equal. Some within the body of Messiah are not of the body of Messiah. Those who want to change scripture, thinking that it needs to change because today's culture is different from that of 2,000 or even 3,500 years ago. Yes, it's correct. The culture has changed, but in some regards it's changed. But God's words and the expectations have not changed. There are those within the body of Messiah who claim to speak for God today, who speak against the scriptures. And we must understand that those people are not speaking for God. They seek to change the scriptures. Homosexuality, wrong. But our culture today, hey, the culture 2,000 years ago had homosexuality and it was spoken against the culture 3,500 years ago. God spoke against the Canaanites who took their babies and put them in jars. And others who took their baby girls and put them outside of the camp to fry in the sunshine. Those things are wrong. And people want to change that. And you can't change it. And there's people in the body of Messiah who want to change that. And I would go as far to say that the people in the body of Messiah who want to change God's scriptures are not of the body of Messiah. They don't hold to the inerrancy of impermanency of God's word. And once you go down that slippery slope, it's very difficult to come back. Now for the believer, our deeds will be judged. We will not be destroyed though. But some of our deeds are going to be burned up on that day. Rabbi Paul, Saul, Shaul, Shaul, speaks of even our worthless deeds being consumed by fire in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting at verse 12. Now if anyone builds on the foundation which is gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day, capital D, will show, will show it because it is to be revealed by fire, and the fire itself will test each one's work, what sort it is. If anyone's work is built on the foundation and it survives, he will receive a reward, but anyone's work, if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but as through the fire. What day? The day of the Lord. The day that Peter says that we are hastening if we live in godliness and holiness. The loss that we're going to suffer is that some of the work that we do and that we're really, really happy with is, and maybe proud of, is going to be burned up. That's because some of the things that we do in life, are, we do for the wrong reason. Everything we do must be done to bring glory to God, otherwise it's going to be burned up. However, you and I as believers will be saved, even though those works will be burned up. Our goal then is to lead lives of holiness and godliness and all that that means so that everything we do brings glory to God. What is one way to live in godliness and holiness? It's when we ask for God's guidance, guidance and direction in the morning and throughout our day, whatever your morning might be. I used to work night shift and morning was 8 p.m. Before you start the day, pray. And then pray without ceasing, ceasing clinging to the words of scripture. It'll be as if a giant snowplow is clearing a path for you. Because what does the scripture say? The enemies flee from before God's word. And when the obstacles drop in front of us, as they sometimes do, we'll be conditioned to ask God, what should we do? And then respond to it quickly. Sometimes we may have to take a few steps back and say, 
Okay, God. I don't understand what's going on. You have a plan. I don't get it. But show me. Show me what you're teaching me. I really don't understand what's going on and what am I supposed to do. And you know what? It's okay to go to God and go, I don't get it. Show me. <laughs> Overall, when we seek God first, we'll have a much more stable and, dare I say, a less anxious life. I'll speak for myself. I don't start the day really, really seeking God sometimes. And if I do that, I have a lot more anxiety through the day. I'm less prepared to pivot throughout the day as conditions change, mainly because I feel somewhat disconnected from God. Think about it. If God's word forces the enemy to flee, why is the enemy able to do end rounds, end rounds around us and sneak up on us? It's because of lack of preparedness, lack of paying attention to the Holy Spirit speaking to us in the moment. Allow me to suggest that I don't think there's enough people who are walking with God. There's a huge number of people, a myriad of thousands, who say that they walk with God, but they don't actually walk with Him. Believers, we need to be serious about our faith because in the long run, it's going to make life easier. There's a time coming, says Adonai, through Zechariah, chapter 3, verse 8 through 10, says, Behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. For behold, the stone I have laid before Joshua, that's the high priest, Joshua, is one stone with seven facets. On it I will engrave the inscription, and inscription declares Adonai Zavot, that I will remove the iniquity of this land in one day. In that day, declares Adonai Zavot, every man will invite his neighbor to sit under the vine and under the fig tree. There will be a substantial change in this world. In one day, I'm a literalist. I, I take this literally. One day. And you go from chaos to every man inviting his neighbor to sit under the vine and under the fig tree because the time is coming where it's going to be so comfortable and easy that we'll invite our neighbors over just to sit and not worry about anything else. It'll be a time of Shabbat. What land is he talking about? Kent, it's not the United States. He's talking about Israel, the promised land. He's looking at the future in this passage, which is where we need to be focused. Today is important. There are things that we need to do today, but our vision has to be out to the future. We need to be looking to the future, to that one day that is completely going to be cloaked in shalom. We just need to get from point A to point B, from today to that day. And in the power of God, through his word, through his spirit, we can get there. Baruch Hashem.